All right, let's say a prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning uh, trying to honor you by what we're doing because of our love for you and because of our love for your word, which we're so grateful that you've given to us. We thank you for teaching us about the gospel, salvation, uh, giving us time to study, and that we're able to live in your Son. Help us to live as you've taught us to live, and not according to the law, not according to our flesh. Help us to learn what it means to walk in the Spirit, and encourage each other to do so. Amen. All right. This morning is a continuation of last week's lesson, where we talked about the end of the law. In Romans 10, verse 4, Paul says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all that believe. And we dealt with what that meant and how the law served a function to show the knowledge of sin up to a point uh, where Christ came. And then it says it was the end of the law for righteousness. The end of the law for righteousness, which is a really a, a, a profound statement. Because whenever you talk to a religious person, and a lot of Christianity, unfortunately, nowadays, uh, they think that either the way they prove they're a Christian, salvation, or the way that they continually live is in some way related to the law God gave uh, to Moses, to Israel. Okay? And so it's Paul alone that talks about this doctrine of righteousness without the law. You've heard me describe before the mystery of Christ and how you can say it simply in that Paul preaches Christ and salvation without the law, without Israel, and without the covenants. And that is unique to the mystery. Nowhere else except in Paul's epistles do you find salvation without the law, without Israel, without the covenants. And so when we talk about that without the law part, that's what we're talking about last week and this week, is that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Okay? This morning I'd like to talk about what it means then to live the alternative lifestyle. And by that, I'm not talking about homosexuality. I'm talking about alternative to law living, okay? Because it's not that it's law or bust. If you don't teach the law, then you're promoting sin. You know, what else, what other way is there? There is a way to live without the law, okay? And I'm not antinomian. The law is holy, just, and good. And it was an expression of God's righteousness given to Israel. It's simply that we've outgrown it. And by that, I don't mean you and I personally, I mean dispensationally. God has taught humanity the knowledge of their sin. He sent Christ to bring salvation. And now with the dispensation of grace, he has communicated to the world how through the mystery of Christ, you can have salvation freely and how you can live by the Spirit in Christ. Okay, so that's what we're talking about this morning is how to live after or according to the Lord Jesus Christ and how that's different in contrast to the law. Okay. In fact, you'll see what Paul says in Galatians 6 is that there's something he calls the law of Christ. And that's in opposition to the law of works, the law of Moses. Right? There's a law of Christ. Well, what is that? A lot of Christians uh, think about the New Testament. They think, well, we're all New Testament Christians, so there's an Old Testament law and a New Testament law. And the New Testament law is the moral law. It's the law of love, you know, and that sort of thing. Not exactly true. We'll deal with that as we get through it today. What we ended last week's lesson with saying was that the law is useful, and there is a use for it. We don't take all the law books, rip them out of our Bible, throw them in the trash can. We All Scripture is profitable, and profitable for instruction, doctrine, reproof, and correction, and uh, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, equipped. And so the law is useful uh, if we use it lawfully, Paul says. 1 Timothy 1, verse uh, it, it was 8 and 9, where he says the law is good if used lawfully, and the law is good if used for an unrighteous man. The law today is of no use to one whose righteousness has imp been imputed to him by Christ through faith. The law is no use to that person. The law is of use to someone who has not yet seen or acknowledges their sin. Well, the law is pretty good at showing people their sin, so you can use the law lawfully in that regard to show them they don't line up with the perfect standard they think they are. You see, you, you have to line up with God's standard, and we all fall short of the glory of God. So the law is useful for the knowledge of sin, as Paul says in Romans 3, verse 20 and 21. But once you get righteousness imputed to you by faith in Christ Jesus, the law suddenly has no use for your growth, for your life, for your uh, encouragement. It does not do that for you. Okay? So what does it for you then? Where do you get your life, your growth, your encouragement? Where do you get your motivation? If it's not from a law that tells you what to do. Right? Well, we'll, we'll learn that this morning. Okay? The law is holy, just, and good, but it cannot give life to sinners. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. When I say I can't give life to sinners, maybe you think initially I'm talking about salvation, and I, I would be. The law cannot save you. But life isn't only the moment you believe in the Gospels, and life doesn't only come from that moment of salvation. 
it's eternal life, folks. And so if the law could not save you and give you life in that moment, it cannot give you life the rest of eternity either. You see, in Galatians 3, verse 21, Paul says that. Galatians 3, verse 21, is the law then against uh, the promises of God? God forbid. If there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So he's pointing out there, the law was righteous. It was good. The problem is that we are not. And so we're the sinners. The law could do nothing to help us. It could only condemn us. And if you're a sinner and you're saved by grace, and so now you're made a saint, okay, the law can't help you maintain your position, sanctified position. It cannot help you maintain your salvation. It couldn't help you before. Why do you think it's going to help you now? If you have a problem with sin, which is what every unbeliever does, the law can't help you. If you're a Christian and you're struggling with sin, the law cannot help you. You understand? The law cannot give benefits to sinners. It must condemn them always. So the law is righteous, and yet it can't give you life. Galatians 3.21, Paul says, if there was a law that could give life, it would have been that one, but it couldn't. Okay? It can't give you life. And so in verse 22, this, but the scripture has concluded all under sin. That's the problem with it. The law would have given life if you didn't have sin, but all have been concluded under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Since you cannot do anything to, to earn righteousness, it must be given to you, imputed to you freely by your belief, uh, the faith of Jesus Christ there, it's in verse 22. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should hereafter afterwards be revealed. We'll deal with that verse a little bit later. Christians think that after Christ saves them, they might... They, they must live after the law. They need to follow the law's pattern. We dealt with that last week. No, that's not, not the position. Okay. There's a difference between living your life as a Christian according to the law or by the law of God and living in Christ. I'm going to try to make that clear this morning. Um, look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. <clears throat> Notice in this passage, Galatians 2 verse 21. Of course, we all understand the Galatian problem. The Galatian problem was that they heard the preaching of the cross and, and heard the gospel of Christ from Paul, and yet they had been persuaded after they had trusted this that they needed to, to be a good Christian, apparently, or a, a good member of the body of Christ, to pursue the law, to follow the law, and that's how they were going to improve. Uh, Paul, of course, uh, teaches them otherwise. In Galatians 2, verse 21, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If, I, if righteousness come by the law then Christ is dead in vain. So again, righteousness there, not only righteousness that you need for salvation, but righteousness you think you're trying to portray in your life from here on out. If righteousness comes by the law, and that's what you think, your law keeping proves you righteous, even after your salvation, then Christ is dead in vain. This verse sets up a contrast between the law and Christ. Do you see it? If you're pursuing the law, Christ is of no effect to you. You might as well have died in vain. But if you're pursuing Christ and live in Christ, then you don't need the law. Do you see the contrast here? He's setting up this difference. Okay, and we'll see that more in his other passages. Of course, Romans 10.4 clarifies that as well when he says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Right? It's either the law or Christ. You have a choice then to make. A choice for salvation, whether you're going to trust your own works or Christ's work, but also in every day you live as a Christian, you have a choice to make, whether you're going to trust yourself or you're going to live in Christ. Or hopefully we'll, we'll nail down what that looks like and how that's different today. Okay? Or is that law of Christ? But there is a difference. In Psalm 119, verse 97, uh, David writes, Oh, how I love thy law! And so in contrast to the law, we're going to talk about Christ this morning, and we're going to talk about, uh, first talk about the love of Christ, and how David says back there, before Christ came, I love your law. He says in Psalm 119, 113, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Amazing. Anybody read Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible? Very encouraging stuff in that psalm, great stuff, where, where David is really glorifying God's word, and is talking about studying God's word, the law specifically. Okay, and, and so it's, it's really encouraging to read that, but he's writing this without the knowledge of Christ, you understand. Christ hadn't yet come. David didn't know Jesus Christ. He knew God, right? He knew his law, and David, being the righteous man that he was, studied his law, meditated on the law, and he said so many times in the Psalms, I love your law. How many of you have said that lately? 
right? Now, Christians like to take that word law and replace it with the Bible and say, well, just say I love the Bible, right? No, he said the law. Remember, David didn't have the rest of the Bible. So David's back there reading what? Deuteronomy? Ex Leviticus? I love your law, God. Really? Bestseller? Is that what that is? Leviticus? You know, is that what you like to say? I always ask you, we can go Leviticus verse by verse, and everybody kind of stares at me like, you're not serious. <laughs> yeah, you, you love the law? That's what David wrote. So you've got to think about the context back there. The way they lived, the way God gave them to live, was according to the law of Moses. How they ate, who they married, wh where they lived, uh, what, they, what they did in the temple, the sacrifices, were all according to the law. That's how they lived. Okay? Their righteousness was determined by the law. Okay? Their position with God was determined by the law. And the law of God was wise. And it would give wisdom to the simple. And it gave wisdom to David and the kings of Israel so that they could uh, benefit and bless the nations of the world. And so people talk about the law in the Bible and how it was revolutionary and how the law of the Bible changed civilizations and history and this sort of business. And how the civilizations that align with God's law, they do well in this sort of business. And people talk about God's law and the impact it has. No doubt, God's law is just, holy, and good. But it is not Christ. The law of Moses is not Christ. And Paul says Christ is far more excellent. Do we believe that, or don't we? Do we think maybe the law and Christ are kind of like, you know, equal? Sometimes we need Christ, sometimes we need the law. Paul says, if you live by the law, if righteousness is by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I'd rather not Christ's death be in vain. And so I'm going to, as much as I can, understand what it means to live in Christ, so I do not make his cross of none effect and live according to the law. Which, it really takes some discernment here, because the law is in the Bible, folks. David, read Psalm 119, he says, I love your law, Right? So if you don't know about the law of Christ, you could be living according to the law, living it and loving it. And people will see you and you, you're, you look good, you behave well, and no one knows the, knows the difference. So it's, it's in here. It's a matter of what you are motivated by. It's a matter of your heart that we're going to be talking about this morning. What are you pursuing? What is it you desire? What is it you love? Because if we're living under the law dispensation, under the law of Moses, then we ought to be teaching, you all need to study Leviticus a lot more. In your homes, you need to study the law of God in Deuteronomy and Exodus. You need to preach the law of God and meditate on it day and night, as Joshua said. Right? And Christian ministries do that, don't they? they? They promote this idea. And like I said, typically they'll replace that word law with the Bible so they can kind of squeeze in the New Testament as well. You know? But th that's what we should be doing if, in fact, we are living according to the law, and that's what we should be doing. But if we're supposed to be living according to Christ, after Christ... What are we supposed to be doing? It's not the law we're meditating on. It's Christ we're meditating on. You say, well, I already know Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. No, it's more than that. Okay, there's something else. And we're going to see about it in Paul's epistles here. Okay? Jesus Christ is God. The law is not God. Can you make the distinction in your mind? The law was given by God. It's an expression of his righteousness, but it is not God, you see. We don't worship the law. We worship God. Jesus Christ is God. He is not the law. So we have to make that distinction. A lot of people read that New Testament verse in Jeremiah 31, where it says, I'll write the law in your hearts. And they take out that word law and they put Jesus in there. They say, oh, the New Covenant's about Jesus. It says law. Yeah, it means Jesus. It's the law of love, you know? Well, you can't just change the Bible that way. It says law in their hearts, which makes a lot of sense to Israel, who was told to live under the law. Okay? It makes no sense to you who are trying to live under grace according to Christ. Why do you need the law in your hearts? You need Christ. See, th there's a difference there. David loved the law because it was from God. That's why he loved it so much. He wasn't worshiping the law because it was God. He loved it because God gave it, and it was truth. It spoke truth and wisdom, and it gave discernment and judgment. Read Psalm 10. It's amazing what the law can give you. You go back and read Proverbs. Wisdom given to Solomon under the law program. Amazing wisdom back there. And wow, you can learn a lot from Proverbs. A lot of wise things in Proverbs. You know what you can also learn in Proverbs? That God will bless you if you do good and curse you if you do bad. Whew. Make sure you spit out those bones, folks. If you're studying Proverbs, understand it's under the law program and that not every promise in Proverbs will work for you. Okay, it just won't work because God gave promises to Israel that he didn't give to you. All right, but meanwhile, David loved the law because God gave it and it was true. The Lord Jesus Christ, compared to the law, or contrast to the law, is a person. And this is of enormous importance that we as Christians are not following simply words or a creed. We have creeds, we study words, certainly. But our head is a person, you understand. 
We are Christians because Jesus Christ is a person whom we follow. He is a savior, okay? Whom we obey, he's our head. He is not the law or command. And that is vastly different than every other religion, okay? Which presents to you God, a spiritual invisible being, if they're monotheist, and a list of rules, the law, just like the law of Moses. There's God and the law, right? That's not Christianity. Christianity is God in the flesh, and so now there's a person that was like you and me, but was God in the flesh. He lived a life, he taught a message, he leads us even today. It's a person that we follow who, coincidentally, did something for you, all right? And that's why a lot of the people who are skeptics to the Bible and all religions, atheists, they'll point this out and say, well, we just don't blindly follow some invisible God. We don't either. God manifest in the flesh was visible, you see. And he spoke words and was the image of the invisible God. And we follow that man, that God, you see. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is a person. And this is going to be very important for this understanding of the mystery of Christ, of walking according to the law of Christ. To understand he was a person. He's not some invisible God, which we also believe that God is the spirit and invisible. And he, he's God in the flesh, okay? It's not just a command. People talk about the law of love in the Bible and say, well, the Old Testament was the law of ceremonies and things, and, and the New Testament the law of love. And of course, I pointed out to you before that actually when Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor, he was quoting the law in the Old Testament, okay? Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, and you'll see here how to live according to the law. According to the law. So we're contrasting living after Christ to living after the law. Paul says, if righteousness come by the law, if you live according to the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Why do you even need him? Right? That's why he's arguing to the Galatians. And Deuteronomy 6 is the law. And it says in verse 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Anybody miss the obvious in those few verses? You say, what? Those are great verses. I mean, God's telling us to love him, and, 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 and we ought to you know, cherish this in our hearts and teach our children. What a great pattern for society. Yeah, I agree. Great pattern for society. You know what's missing here? Is that he commanded you to do it. Imagine telling your wife that. You will love me. <laughs> Why? It would be a question that naturally arises, right? Can love be forced? Well, that's what God said. What's the greatest law? Love God. What if I don't? You're punished. What kind of love is that? Well, it's a required love because God is righteous. He is true, and we need to love God. And if we don't, we're against truth and righteousness, right? So it's, it's a righteous law. But first, can you do it? Not all of us do it all the time. Israel broke, this is the chief law, and if you break any law you sin against any sin, you're breaking this law, loving God. Okay? And yet, notice the law was a command. What the law responded to people was that you will do this. When well, they said, how do I do it? You're just going to do it. All right? And that's what the law says, all right? Jesus is not the law. If you're living after Christ, you're not, it's not under a law. Christ doesn't look at you and say, all right, I'm here, you will love me. It, he doesn't command the law that way. He is a person, which we'll cover in a bit, did something for you, and what happens after you hear what he did for you and you trust what he did for you? Amazingly, without command, perhaps love generates by itself. That's an amazing thing. And so contrast to, you will do it, you will, it says in verse 6, it's an interesting verse here, these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. It's not just a command of outward expression of love, it's an inner love that is commanded of you. You see how impossible this law is? So when Christians talk about the law of love, and that's the law that we follow today, they're not knowing what they're saying. You, you can't do Deuteronomy 6 verse 6 without Christ. You can't do it at all. How am I supposed to stop the love of God into my heart? And we all wake up in the morning sometimes and just, we don't have it. It's not there, right? And you've got to generate it. You've got to, i got to love God this morning. You say a prayer and you study the word and you, 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 you remind yourself that, yeah, he died for me and, you know, I should live for him, right? 
Deuteronomy 6, 6 says, you will put it in your heart. It's a command. Jesus Christ is a person. Love would fulfill the law. Romans 13, verse 9 says that. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For love fulfills the law. Well, this is true. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor. So if you love, you would fulfill the law. The problem is none of us can do it. You can't by fiat, by command, make people love. If that were the case, then that's the law we should pass in Congress. I think so. Okay? We need that law to pass through public and Congress. You know, thou shalt love our neighbor. I mean, if that fulfills all the other laws, we can get rid of the Federal Register. We just all love each other. What's the problem? Well, we all know it doesn't work that way. And yet when it comes to Christianity, somehow we think we're better than the rest. Right? We think, well, now that I'm saved, I can do it. Really? Couldn't do it before. You wouldn't do it if there was a law. What makes you think you're going to do it now? There's a difference between living according to the law and living after Christ. Okay? Living under the law means you need to know what the law says. If you're living under the law and you talk about love being the law, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, you just know what that looks like, right? So you go back to the law and you learn about love and you learn what it means to love your neighbor and, and cook things for them and that sort of thing or whatever that is that they do and the offerings and sacrifices and the helping the poor. and the, You learn about all the laws and you study God's laws and it's amazing. Look at this great idea here that the way they set up their economic system and their religion and the way they help the poor and help provide it to the priests and you study the law. When you live under the law, that's what you study. That's what you're mindful of, right? Christians say, well, tell me what to do. You know, what ought I do? What do good works look like? And, and as soon as you start making a list, you're under the law. You're walking according to the law, and you're going, well, let me study that law. In contrast, living according to the law is living according to Christ. If you live under Christ, you start to mind the things of Christ. You start to have the mind of Christ. Instead of a, a legal mind, the mind of the law, and saying, well, I live as a Christian according to these 25 standards, you have only one, Christ. Right? You live after Christ. Now, it's hard for us, I think, in our flesh especially, to say, you're, you're telling me that I don't need any of those laws, even the greatest one, and Christ is all that I need? And now I say the words, and it sounds like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Christ is all you need. That law which you thought was so significant, and it was a great law, you don't need. Okay, You don't need it. Well, there's good things in that law. I know there's good things in that law. All you need is Christ. Christ is more excellent than that law. That is what the mystery is about. Charlie Brown. And meanwhile, <clears throat> sorry, I had to throw that in there. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Look at Colossians 1. <laughs> My first point here is pointing out that Christ is different than the law. I hope that's obvious, but I'm trying to show you why that is. He is a person. He is God manifest in the flesh. If you're going to walk after some thing that has been manifest, it would not be God's law. It would be Christ himself. Okay, much more excellent. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Tell me, what inspires people more than words? Right? It would be deeds, actions, people, Images. People say a picture speaks a thousand words. Words are so amazing. Ask a poet. Right? Ask, ask the literature writers. Words are great. God inspired and preserved words. Words teach and communicate. They're wonderful. But there are things beyond words, folks. May we all say amen? Yes. There are things beyond words. The law is commanding you to do something. They're just words. Good words. Righteous words. Right statutes. But they're words. We're talking about serving a person. Okay? And what inspires people more than words our people, okay? The Syrian refugees were in the news for how many weeks before the image of that little boy on the beach? And what happened? Oh, the boy on the beach! The image, right, inspired people to take action. They could read about it in the newspapers for weeks. You know how long Christians have been trying to put prayer back in schools? We need to pray more in this country. If my people will call by my name, we'll pray. They quote the law wrongfully, you know, that sort of thing. A terrorist kills 100 people in Paris, and what's the world cry? Pray for Paris. Why? Because they saw a need for it. Remember how many times a Christian said, you need to pray, you need to pray, you need to pray. It didn't happen until they saw the need for it. They saw an action, they saw an image that said, we need to pray. And everybody says, pray for Paris. Where's the atheist now, you know? Where's the atheist saying, don't pray for Paris? You don't see him. Pray for Paris. What inspires people to act 
more than just words and commands are people and actions. When you live after Christ, what are you following? A person who has done something for you. That's living after Christ. Our motivation for living is a person, and not just any old person, God manifest in the flesh, who did something, and not just something, but everything for you. If that doesn't motivate you, the law's not going to help, folks. Okay? And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the love of Christ, or the law of Christ, is walking that way. We have to move our affections from the law to Christ. I can tell husbands to love their wives till my face turns blue, and wives won't believe it, and men won't do it, until they see something, right? When wives see something their husbands do, they, now they feel the love. Or when husbands see something in their wife that makes them want to love them, it naturally occurs. I say, love your wife. Yeah, I know. But then they see their wife admiring them and being a great wife and a godly wife, and suddenly they just they show love for them because it's natural to love them. And it's, it's amazing how that works. There's something else beyond just the commanding, is what I'm trying to point out here. And it's Christ. In fact, in the metaphor of Ephesians 5 of instructing, love your wife, reverence your husband, Ephesians 5, what does Paul talk about? Christ in the church. It wasn't even about the commands. It wasn't him commanding husbands and wives. It was talking about Christ in the church and the relationship, and how Christ gave his life for the church, and the church subject, is subject to Christ. It's Christ and his actions. It's what God is doing. That's the law of Christ. Right? Well, tell me exactly what a wife's supposed to do. You live after Christ, and you do exactly what a wife's supposed to do. Right? What's a husband supposed to do? Tell me the, the, the thing specifically. How many dishes do I have to wash? Right? You live after Christ, and you won't have to ask the question. You understand? You don't need the law if you live after Christ. You don't need it. So that's the issue, is are you pursuing Christ? You say, what does that look like? You keep saying that. What does that mean? We'll deal with that in a moment. We've got to move our affections past the law. The thing that we desire to do, the desire to obtain, should not be the law. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 24, Paul says, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. We have to move past our affections being placed on the laws to our affections being placed on the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 16, 22, that was the Corinthian problem, by the way. The Corinthians, they, they grabbed a hold of that preaching of the cross, salvation by grace. They just grabbed it. You know, we love it. Liberty. You mean we have to follow those Jewish laws to be a Christian? This is great. We're on board. And then what did they do after this? They didn't live after Christ, of course. They lived according to their flesh. They had the opposite problem, the Galatians. They weren't even trying to live after the law. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, well, to solve all this problem, and the real issue here is that they don't love Christ. They don't love him. He didn't say they weren't saved. I hope you hear the difference there. Salvation is not you loving Christ. <laughs> okay? Uh, salvation is by grace through faith. But in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Anathema, that means accursed. It's the second time in Paul's epistles he accurses someone. In Galatians 1, they're cursed if they preach another gospel. Here in 1 Corinthians 16, they should be cursed, outcast, if they don't love the Lord. Right? Why? Because they don't love the Lord, they're not living after the Lord. They're not living after the Lord. What kind of example and pattern is that in the church? It's not one. Right? So if they're not loving the Lord, what are you doing here? If you don't love Jesus Christ, what are you doing here? Really, I mean, are you trying to earn brownie points? You know salvation's not, it's by grace, not by your works. You can be saved and not be here. That's one of the greatest parts about grace. You don't have to come to church and be saved. I'm giving you opportunity to leave, and you're all still here. Why? Is it because you love the Lord? Is it because you want to live after Christ? You want to do his will? And that's what the Corinthians were missing, you see. The Corinthians did not have that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8 that if you love the Lord, it'll be known of you. It'll be known of you if you love the Lord. You'll say, what, I got, what do I have to do to be a good Christian? Love the Lord, and it will be known of you. You know, by, what, by what, what you're doing in love of the Lord, okay? So the love of Christ is very different than saying, I love the law, I meditate on the law day and night, I follow the law. You don't need it. All you need is Christ, okay? Ephesians 3, verse 16, that's what Paul prays for, by the way. Paul prays not that the Ephesians would meditate on God's law and know God's law and that they would pass a good law so that the church would be able to operate in a legal system that is righteous and godly. Ephesians 3, verse 16, he, he prays, that God would grant them according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend 
with all saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. It seems to me that surpasses the law. The law gives you God's statutes. It doesn't even give you all of his statutes, I mean, everything that's right. It doesn't speak about everything. It only speaks about 613 things. But here, Paul says, I pray that Christ will dwell in your hearts, that you'll be able to comprehend, comprehend what is past knowledge. What is past knowledge? And past what you do, beyond what your actions are, is who you are in Christ. Okay? And it says in verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. If you want to be filled with the fullness of God, you cannot get there by keeping all 613 laws. Can't do it. If you want to be filled with the fullness of God, apparently, you have to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. You see, so this is what it means to live after the Lord. Okay? You say, how does that work? How does that work? Well, let's cover that briefly. Look at Matthew 22. I want to now talk about the law of Christ. We've dealt with why you need to love the Lord and not the law in this dispensation. And by that, I'm not meaning you hate the law. I hope you heard that. It's simply that the love of Christ is what you need that excels over the law. Matthew 22, what is the law of Christ? What is this way of living after Christ? Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus in his earthly ministry here to Israel, when asked about the greatest of the commandments, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. We read that in Deuteronomy 6. That's a command, right? And so God just said, this is what you're required to do. You're required to love me. Okay? We've got an agreement. I'm your God. You're my people. You've got to love me. Verse 38, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if I don't like him, you need to love him. You're required to. What if they're ugly? You've got to love them. Right? What, what if they mow on my lawn? You've got to love them. You've got to love your neighbor. That's the law. Okay? Of these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Apparently, you keep these two commandments, the rest of the law is not a problem. Okay? You're back there in the Old Testament, and there's a lot of laws that seem to have nothing to do with loving God or your neighbor. <laughs> um, but they do. If God tells you to do something, you do it. If God tells you not to cut the corners of your beard, you, you don't. And that's what those laws had to do with. Okay? But if you kept those first laws, all the laws and all the prophets and all the complaints the prophets had against them, th there's no problem. If you're loving God, love your neighbor. That's the sum of the laws. The problem, of course, is that we can't do it. We've already established that. So what is the law of Christ? Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Galatians 3. I told you we'd come back to this verse earlier. Understand that when you live according to the law, as we mentioned before, it makes the cross of Christ and Christ himself of no effect to you. It's meaningless what he did and who he was. Okay? That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, in verse 23, if I ever get there, that we are shut up unto the faith. Galatians 3 verse 23. Before faith came, faith in what? Faith in Christ. Before Christ came, before faith in Christ came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. That means we were closed off from the faith. We, we could not operate by faith alone because we were under the law. You understand? That's what Galatians 3 verse 23 says. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Christ and the law were in opposition to each other. Doctrinally speaking, okay? When Christ came, he was the end of the law, right? If we're following the law, Christ is of none effect. Galatians 3.23 says, when we, we being sensational, we, we being the humanity, were under the law in time past, right? There was, no, there was no communication from God about the need for your faith in a person alone. It was, if you believe in God in the Old Testament, you will do his laws. Faith in the Old Testament manifested itself by obedience to the law, Right? That's why James says faith without works is dead. Because their faith was in following the instructions God told them to do, which was works. And so faith without works is not faith at all, you see. Our faith isn't in works. Our faith is in Christ. So faith without Christ is dead faith today. Christ is not works. Christ is not the law. Okay? Galatians 3.23 says that. 
that before faith came, before Christ came, there was no way we could walk after Christ, walk by faith alone, in Christ alone. That couldn't happen under the law program. Okay? And so, how does this work then? How do we walk after Christ? How do we live according to the law of Christ? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Well, first we need to understand that Jesus Christ, we know that he's God, we know he's a person, we've covered that he's the image, the invisible God, he's manifest in the flesh, but he's not just any old person. It's not that we're choosing some person and saying, well, now we'll follow him. He's the celebrity, he's the leader. You know, Jesus is the famous guy. Well, no, it's, it's not just him and who he was, it's what he did. Because a God would not be worth serving, he would not be worthy of worship if he was not expressing his love and holiness and justice. And what kind of God is that? An unloving, unjust, unholy God? That's not worthy of worship. Again, I refer to the atheists just as a spectacle because it's always so funny what they say. And the atheists say, well, I can't serve a God that's unholy and unjust and unloving, thinking that God is all of that. And I laugh and say, I wouldn't either. And I don't. God is holy, God is just, God is love. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the light, he is where life comes from, and that is Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh. But more than just him being that, he showed that by his actions when he died on the cross for you. Romans 5 verse 8, God commended his love toward us that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. What's the law of Christ? It's looking at Christ, it's looking at him and what he did and saying, wow, that's my pattern, that's the way I gotta live? Okay, <laughs> that's the law of Christ. You say, well, that's not specific enough. It is. It is. Apply that to every situation in your life. Okay? Crucify yourself. Right? Trust in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be a new creature. Right? Bear another's burdens. That's what Christ did on the cross, didn't he? He bore our burdens. Consider and meditate on what he did and who he was. And you'll see that if you follow Christ, you don't need the law. Love fulfills the law. I say Christ fulfills all things, right? You follow him, you don't need a law. You crucify yourself, you don't need a law to tell you what to do. You bear another's burdens, you don't need a law to tell you what to do, okay? And beyond that, it gives you the power to do it according to the resurrection. We'll see that in a moment here. First Timothy chapter four, verse 10, Jesus Christ wasn't just a man, he wasn't just God, he was a savior. The savior, and we say that so flippantly in Christianity because we've been saying it for 2,000 years. Timothy 4, verse 10, Therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Why? <clears throat> Paul, why do we labor? Why do we suffer? Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. The Savior. It's not, why do we labor? Why do we go to church? Why do we suffer reproach? Because of God. Because God told us we got to. Well, that would be righteous to do what God said, to be obedient to the commandments. Well, that's not why he says. He's just because we trust the living God, who is the Savior. It's because God saved us. Because we were going to die, and God came to us and saved us. And because he did that, that's why we labor. That's motivation. That's inspiration. Why is the world praying for Paris? Because there are people killed over there. They need it. Well, God manifested himself to humanity. We needed help, and he saved us. Okay, there'd be heroes who stopped those terrorists. There'll be heroes, right? And who is Jesus Christ, who saved the world? If not that, you see? Living after Christ is just that. It's recognizing who he is, what he did, and saying that's the motivation for why I live, and what I do, why I do. Okay, 1 Timothy 4, verse 10. The law of works, the law of commandments, only motivates you with fear, guilt, and shame. That's what the law is. Okay? I'm not disparaging God. The law is righteous, holy, and good, but you're not. And so why would anyone keep the law? Okay? If they were going to do it anyway, the law is meaningless. Right? But they keep it because they're afraid of the punishment. Right? Or they want the blessing. That's what the law was given. If you do good, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll curse you. And that's what the law communicated. The law communicated our own self-righteousness, our own unrighteousness. As it says, look, here's the law, a perfect, let's make a deal. <laughs> that's what God said. Here it is. You get blessings if you keep it, curses if you don't. We'll see who, what comes of this. And of course, it showed us all to be sinners. Okay? And so, the law of works only motivates with fear, guilt, and shame. And I've, I've told you, I don't know how many times, that a greater motivator than guilt 
than fear, I got to do this or else God's going to strike me down with lightning, is love. Okay? Greater motivator to do all that you do is love. And I always bring up the example of, of parents, you know, and their children. And there, there's, there's no law that says parents need to treat their children with love, you know, to do them this way. And yet parents world over love their children and, and keep their children and raise their children. Why? Because of love. Because they love their children. A greater motivator than guilt and fear and shame is love. Fear, guilt, and shame, that'll motivate you as well. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying love is a greater motivator. Okay? You do more motivated by love. And what we, we talked about already is the love of Christ and your love of Christ. And Christ's love manifested to you on the cross. And so the law of Christ is you recognizing that and walking accordingly. Okay? Letting your motivation being the love of Christ, walking after Christ, pursuing Christ, knowing Christ. Let your life be Christ and you'll live as you ought to live, okay? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. <clears throat> Paul talks about what we're speaking of this morning in 2 Corinthians 5, when he says about his own behavior, in verse 13, whether we be beside ourselves, it is of God, whether we be sober, it is for your cause, why is Paul doing what he's doing? That's what he's addressing here. Why is Paul suffering and laboring and ministering to these Corinthians and, and sacrificing so much? And it seems like, Paul, you can have it a little easier if you just compromise here or there, just didn't do so much ministry. Or just, you know, why is he doing what he's doing? Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ constrains him. I thought the law was, you know, the law of Moses was a bondage. I thought that's what constrains us. Yeah, it constrains you by fear and guilt and shame, but the lo love of Christ constrains you a different way. Because look what he says. He says, because, the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge, we determine, we acknowledge, we judge that if one died for all, if Christ died for us all, then we're all dead. If Christ died for all men, that means all of us are dead men, right? If God said, I need to die for them, he knew that everybody was going to die. And that's what the Bible says. We're all concluded in sin, right? And Paul says, because we know that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him which died for them and rose again. I've said that I don't know how many times as a motivation for how we live, what, how we live. But notice what he's saying here. He's saying because of Christ and what he did on the cross to save us is the motivation <clears throat> for what we do, what we do. Okay. He loved us to die for us. He loved sinners to die for them. He loved dead men to die for us. And if he did that for us, then we ought to live for him. The life we receive ought to be lived for the one who saved us. Right? This is natural. This is normal. This is acceptable, as Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 says. Okay? If you're on the precipice of death and someone saves you from it, you go, oh, thanks. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Don't you see a, a, an obligation, a gratitude, a love for this person at all? And this is who Jesus Christ is. We often overlook this as Christians. We think, oh, yeah, Jesus Christ, he's, he's a church guy. He's, he is your savior. And he's the way to live beyond that. He's not just a past tense what he did, but he is the way you have life now. Okay. So how then does the love of Christ constrain us? Paul mentions in verse 15. Now, when I talk about the love of Christ, and I talk about the love of Christ constraining us, we're not talking here about the law of love. Remember, it's not just a law. It's Christ himself. Okay? People talk about the moral law versus ceremonial law. Have you ever heard that? And say, well, the law of God, there's ceremonial laws, like, you know, the sacrifices and, and things like that. And then there's the moral law, which is like, obey your parents. Right? Honor your, honor your father and mother. So there's moral law and there's ceremonial law. And they make this distinction, by the way, which is a kind of a false distinction to begin with. Yeah, th there are differences in the laws. But what they'll say is that, that Christ died to end the law, ceremonial law, sacrifices. He didn't come to end the moral law. So the moral law is still applicable to us. You ever heard that? That, yeah, you know, we don't keep the ceremonial stuff that Israel did, but we, we still need to follow the moral law. I mean, love God, love your neighbor, honor your father and mother, thou shalt not steal. These are moral laws, not ceremonial laws. 
And so we're still under those. Well, I hope I've already proven to you that that's impossible for you to do. But that's what we're talking about here. When we talk about the love of Christ constraining you, we're not talking about the law of love and commanding you to love Christ. We're talking about the principle and the person about what Christ did and you looking at him and what he did. And this should motivate you to pray. Okay. What's your motivation to prayer? It, do, you, do you pray because I got to? Do you pray because there's a law that says you should? What will motivate you to pray is when you consider what Christ did for you. Then you'll pray to him. Because you'll realize, yeah, he died for me and I haven't spoken to him in how long? Yeah, you should pray. You should pray and consider perhaps, you know, how you can live after Christ more than live after yourself. Live according to the law. Okay? Your, your works. And so, we're not talking about the moral law here. In Galatians 6, verse 2, we're spending a lot of time in Galatians this morning, Paul mentions this law of Christ. And he mentions this law of Christ to the very people who are trying to keep the law of Moses for righteousness. And he spends five chapters saying, no, no, you know, Christ is the end of the law. And, and if you follow the law, Christ is dead in vain. And Galatians 5 even says, in, in verse uh, 3, I testify again to you, every man that is circumcised is a debtor to keep the whole law, and Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Galatians 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. You know, Christ is freedom from the law. You being under the law is rejecting Christ, you see. That's how that is. So you need to choose the right one here. But to these same people in Galatians 6, verse 2, there is a way that they live. And Galatians 6 is talking about that. He says, here's the way you live. He says in verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. He's talking about the, the law of Moses here. You want to fulfill the law of Moses? Love God and love your neighbor. Greatest commandments under the law. You want to fulfill the law of Christ? Bear ye one another's burdens. Because that's exactly what Christ did. Right? That's what it means to look at Christ and what he did. What did Christ do? He humbled himself. Right? He became a man. He uh, lowered himself. He took upon himself our burdens. He suffered death for other people that didn't deserve it. Uh, he raised from the dead with power of resurrection. And now he sits in heavenly places. And so what's the law of Christ? Maybe we need to humble ourselves. Maybe we need to crucify ourselves. Maybe we need to lower ourselves to help other people with problems they don't deserve to be helped with. And then perhaps we can live with the power of resurrection and knowing that we have eternal life and joy with God forever in heavenly places. This is the law of Christ. You see? It does things that the law, could, the law of Moses could never do. The law of Moses could never give you the assurance of eternal life. It could never give you the joy of obtaining righteousness, because you never could. The law could never give you life once you sinned. It only condemns you. The law of Christ says, I'm crucified, I'm already dead, and yet I live. That's the law of Christ. The law says, you're dead. Right? Gotcha. There's a difference. So Paul says the law of Christ, bear you one another's burdens. That's what the law of Christ teaches. Okay? And we don't do that by just simply saying, I need to bear another's burdens. I need to bear another's burdens. You think of Christ. What did he do for me? What did he do for me? And when you do that, you will know how you respond to others. In any situation. Right? In your marriage, in your relationships, in your life, know what Christ did to you, and you will be the members of the body of Christ to others. That's how that, that works. You can see this in action, by the way, in all of Paul's epistles. I, I listed a few of them there. I've already mentioned Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 with marriage, husband and wife, where Paul doesn't just command the husband and wife, as a lot of people teach it. They totally throw out the part about Christ in the church. They just talk about the commands, because that's what they want. You know, I need, I need something to, to, to really wrangle my husband or, you know, really subject my wife. So they take the commands. But really, the point of Ephesians 5 is the Christ in the church part. I mean, without that, the commands are meaningless and helpless. And they don't really do much. But... Consider Christ. The great mystery is Christ in the church, Paul says. Consider who you are in Christ and what Christ did for you. And that's how you live, even in your marriage. You see? And so you crucify yourself. You're crucified with Christ. In Titus chapter 3, notice it here. There's an example that Paul applies this law of Christ to how uh, Titus should be teaching his congregation to live. He says in verse 1, Titus 3, verse 1, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness to all men. You see, that's a lot of commandments there. I mean, I have to memorize that, just to remember all that good stuff. No, no, this is what you know. Just, just remember 3, 4, and 5, and you'll be good with all of it. 
Verse 3 says, We ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. I'm not like those terrorists. They are so hateful. Right? Those politicians, they lie all the time. And those people that fornicate everywhere, were, oh, make me angry. Titus 3 verse 3 says, We ourselves were also sometimes this. Perhaps that will give you the, the mind of Christ about the situations in the world. Does that mean that they're right? No, but neither were you. Right? The law of Christ gives you the proper perspective of how to respond to things. Okay? According to Christ, not according to the law. Verse 4 says, After that the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. And so you see, he says that gospel verse right after telling them how to treat other people. Right? Because that's the motivation. You know, how do you treat these guys over there? Well, you need to treat them how you were treated because you were sinful and didn't deserve nothing and, you know, were good for nothing. And, and then God saved you out of his kindness, not by your works of righteousness. And so, can God save the terrorist? Answer, yes. Right? Should they kill people? No. <laughs> do we need to try to stop them? Yeah. But you know what the church's response is? They need salvation. They need Christ. Right? And then a different response? The Christians have given up Christ for the law as their tool of changing the world. It didn't change them. It makes them think they're going to change the world. Right? Christ is the only answer. Christ is who will change people. He's the one that will give life. Now, that's the law of Christ. That's all we're supposed to preach. Philippians 2 says a similar pattern. Another example where Paul's telling the Philippians to have one mind, and as a, a, a motivation for that, he says, remember what Christ did. Christ humbled himself, and became a man, and would be unto death. So he constantly goes back to Christ. Look up Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians 3, we covered Philippians verse by verse, and that's all that Philippians is about, Christ. Paul, it, it irks me sometimes when people say, you make too much of Paul, because I talk about Paul a lot, you know, and we deal with Paul's apostleship, but have you read what Paul said? Paul speaks more of Christ than anybody else in the Scripture. And so when we say, I follow Paul's pattern as he followed Christ, we're preaching Christ according to the cross. We're preaching the law of Christ. We're preaching Philippians 3, verse 9, 10, and 10, where Paul says, I would know nothing save the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. It's all about Christ. That's what Paul's saying. In Philippians 3, verse 9, verse 8 and 9, he says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Well, I'm sure there's a few things we can learn from the law that will be good. Paul says, it's all loss. The knowledge of Christ is what you need. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and who count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. So you see, it's right in the context we're talking about. It's not law, it's Christ. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. So you see, that's Paul's motivation. That's his reason for living. In Philippians 1, verse 21, he says, to live is Christ. That's what he says. And when that's what you're trying to do, Philippians 3, 9, and 10, is pursue that, and to know and be conformable to his sufferings and his resurrection, I have a good inkling, you're going to be walking down the right track. And not only doing right, but doing right, proclaiming Jesus Christ, which is a difference than just doing right. That's what the law does. The law says do right. Grace says do right, Proclaiming Christ, by Christ, through Christ. And so there's a difference. Colossians 2.2 2 says, All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in, want to guess where? The law? No, Jesus Christ. Well, the law, there's so much more book about the law here. It says, All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in Christ. You meditate on him, you won't need that law. Right? That's why we're Christians, you see. That's why they called them Christians, because they pursued Christ, not the law. Life in Christ, pursuit of him, is not pursuit of the rudiments of the world. In Colossians 2, verse 8, uh, Paul says that uh, beware, is what he says. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ, you see. If anything distracts you from Christ, I'd say it's not bad to avoid it. You say, well, you don't seem very intelligent. Christ is all I need, is what the Bible says. We well, sound like one of those faith guys. Yeah, Christ is my Savior and God, and he gives me eternal life and forgiveness and righteousness. There's really nothing else that I need apart from him. That should be our position, okay? And yet the world wants to 
encroach upon that with philosophy and traditions. And the rudiments of the world in verse 8 there is the law. Drop down to verse 20. He says, if you be dead with Christ, which is what we know by the gospel, from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. These are commandments and doctrines of men. So Colossians 2 there, he's saying, you follow the law, you're not following the head. You're not, you're not you're pursuing Christ. Life in Christ is called the crucified life by people. Why? Because when you apply it to yourself and you're walking according to Christ and, and pursuing Christ, you crucify, you reckon yourself dead. Crucifixion is your manner of living. Right? Whenever your old man rises up and says, you know what I want to do? When you live after Christ, the mind of Christ goes, you don't matter. That's what the mind of Christ says. If you don't hear that voice in your head, you need to be in scriptures more. You need to pray more. You need to pursue Christ more, not the law. Consider what he did and realize who you are. When you realize the sin, sinner that you are, when your old man rises up, you'll understand the vanity of that, that voice. Okay? I'm not saying I'm cured of this. I'm not saying you are either, but that's how you approach it. Okay? Understanding who you are in the flesh. When your flesh says something, you say, I know who you are. Right? Christ died to crucify you. Right? That's what living after Christ means. It's also called the resurrected life by some people. Why? Because it gives you a power the law can't. Romans 8, 2 says the law was powerless to give you the ability to do right. But in Christ, you can have righteousness freely. In Christ, you have the power to reckon your old man dead. You have the power not under the law to do right. How? The love of Christ constrains you. Okay. It's called the resurrected life because you, you can rejoice in resurrection in that power in living now. You don't have to wait until the test is over and then, you know, well, I've kept so many laws and, that, and therefore I'm a good Christian. You're in Christ. Read Romans 6, 7, and 8. We've talked about Romans 6, 7, and 8 before, but it, that all talks about this life in Christ principle. Okay. So the, real, the question we need to, to ask ourselves, which we asked at the beginning, is who are we going to serve? We have a choice to make. Are we going to serve the law or are we going to serve Christ? Are we going to pursue our own righteousness, our own good behavior for its own merits, or are we going to pursue Christ and because we're doing that, you know, we, we live accordingly, right? There's no evaluation of your old man. It's me trying to know the sufferings of Christ, me trying to know the resurrection of Christ in my life. There could be many laws and many civilizations have copied God's laws. America could copy God's laws. And without the pursuit of Christ, our nation is godless. You understand? We can have the laws of Israel mandated by the Constitution and our nation will be godless without Christ. You see? We need Christ. And there's only one Christ, by the way. There can be many laws in different countries. There's only one Lord, one Christ. Colossians 3, 3 says, Our life is hid with Christ in God. Do you believe that? I mean, if you believe your life is hid with Christ in God, then you don't need the law. You're not trying to walk after the law. You're not making a list of things that you ought to do so that you are better as a Christian. You concentrate on you being in Christ, being a member of his body, and on what he did and who he was, and you'll be right where Christ wants you, right where God wants you. Okay? Any questions about that? Any comments? Good stuff. Okay. Lord, we thank you so much for dying for our sins and for promising us eternal life, giving us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, for teaching us what it means to humble ourselves and, and to die for others in hell. By dying for others, dying to ourself, from that can come resurrection and come that, from that can come life. We thank you for those benefits. We thank you that, uh, that we can uh, enjoy the fruits that you have provided for us. I pray that we would just bear those out in our life and not reject you in what you've done, not to forget you in what you've done, not to ignore you. Rather, make you the sole purpose for what we do and the sole purpose of why we meet and why we minister. We thank you for, for all that you've done and that you will do through us and the souls that will be saved. Amen. Thank you, folks.